please mute yourself. That would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, this is um, th this was sort of pulled together last minute, um, both um, the show and the presentation. Um, so this exhibition, Continuing Conversations, um, is really a gallery installation. It is a distilled version of the Break the Mold exhibition that we were planning in conjunction with um, NCMA. Now, NCMA's version of that exhibition did go forward, even though it was a show that originated with The Mint. We had to cancel our portion of the exhibition um, because of budgetary restraints. Um, it was just proving to be too expensive for shipping and creating costs. Um, but because as many of you know, or all of you know, um, we have closed the third floor uh, craft and design permanent galleries um, starting yesterday um, so that uh, c and &E can have ample time and literally space to overhaul those galleries with the new and exciting installation of Craft in the Lab that Annie and Rebecca Elliott um, in conjunction with Joel Smeltzer um, and colleagues Nell and E, um, they are completely overhauling those galleries. So um, it, Todd was concerned that we wouldn't have any um, objects of craft on view. Um, and so because Break the Mold was um, really predicated on that premise of um, contemporary artists using craft traditions to make social and contemporary critiques, um, I decided to move forward with um, a smaller version of that show, focusing on mint collection objects and um, objects here in Charlotte, so we didn't have the shipping costs. Um, and so that is um, the installation that I'm gonna be talking about in the project room. Um, now, just to remind everyone, we um, two years ago when we did New Days, New Works, the first Zoom presentation that talked about these, um, uh, the exhibitions, um, I explained that we were going to start a new installation in the Gorelick Galleries here in Mint Museum Uptown on the third floor um, that were going to allow certain um, discrete spaces to allow for specific installations. Oops. Um, so this is an overview of those galleries and I'm just gonna uh, use my cursor to talk about them. This isn't quite, um, what the show is, but the general gist is there. So this resource room is becoming a design gallery. So um, an installation that explores different ways that graphic design or other elements of design, um, digital design um, are being used in artwork. Uh, we built a digital gallery here um, which we did use for Silent Streets. It was already kind of constructed with that purpose. Then this back gallery is going to be used to um, install recent acquisitions or new works. Um, so this, as we said during New Days, New Works, came out of the idea that we are getting all of these exciting donations to the museums and we're making all of these purchases that usually when we buy an artwork, it's because it is immediately relevant, either because the artist is, you know, exploding at some point in their career, or the artwork that they're making is very relevant to something going on. And so getting it on view as soon as possible is kind of key to, to um, really capitalizing on the topical importance of that work. Um, but because um, we have so many projects going on and actually a very small staff that's supporting the number of projects that we have going on. Um, we really don't have the bandwidth to put those works on view for anywhere from 12 months to in some cases, 36 months. So we thought that we could um, create this space in Gorelick that could um, allow us once to twice a year to install these new works um, and celebrate them immediately. This is both, as I said, to capitalize on the importance of the works to um, 
conversations going on in real time, but also it celebrates those donors that have made these purchases possible. As you'll see, many of them were donations from outside the museum, either in money to buy the works or the works themselves. Um, so this whole back gallery is dedicated to recent acquisitions, or in one case, a new work that was just made. This space here, um, when you first walk in, this is the project room, um, so the, or the project space. So these installations are supposed to um, be a bit more nimble, allowing us to do these um, either focus installations of artists who are particularly interesting right now um, for whatever reason, um, because of social relevance or because they've hit a certain stride in their career or to address contemporary issues. Um, now, this is the space, this project space is where um, I've installed that um, sort of distilled version of Break the Mold, which is now called um, Yesterday and Today. Um, so I am going to go through um, really this, sorry, this portion of the install. So quick cover of the design gallery. Um, the digital gallery is actually on hold. This is going to be um, Jason Mitchum's pump jack. You see the painting here and then the digital projection here. We've had to put this on hold because of delays in getting the projector that we need. It's a three channel projection. So um, we have two projectors and we need a third. Um, so this is going to be opening at a later date. To be honest, I don't have a date for when the projector is coming in. So right now it's just on hold. Um, and then, uh, so then I will talk about the recent acquisitions and new works in this back gallery. Um, and then around 10 o'clock, um, we'll get to the project room space um, and the yesterday and today installation. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that's because um, we have two of the artists joining us to talk about their works. Ilan Din, who um, is already on the call, and then Nadia Meadows, who um, will be joining us at 10 a.m. during um, her lunch break because she works. Um, so, um, I mean, all artists work. I mean, she works like an uh, in-office job in addition to her studio practice. Um, so, I'm also going to say that I am not going into full detail about um, all of the works, a lot of the works, um, all of the label text and wall text is on Teams. There is also a profile that gives a um, brief overview of what all of these installations are. All of that, I believe at this point has been moved to the exhibitions um, team on Teams. Um, that is accessible to everyone. So if you want more information, want more details, please go there and visit that um, area and you can uh, read all of this more in depth. The show is going to be fully installed by the end of this week and the labels will be up early next week. It opens December 23rd. So you can also go and visit it um, in real time. So the um, design gallery, so that what was formerly the resource room, is going to have um, this really wonderful video animated work by William Cabero. I, hopefully some of you met him. Uh, he's in residency at McCall. He actually just left his piece, Victor and Isolina. You can actually view this online. Um, it's on Vimeo. Um, William felt very strongly. Um, the work is about his um, his first generation immigrant grandparents, um, first generation for the continental United States. They are Puerto Rican, so they're American. Or so if I do wear it on Saturday, I gotta take a picture and send it to them. Um, them you know. Someone mute, I'm not mm -hmm. sure who's talking. Okay, um, no, someone's talking. So um, anyway, so that uh, William felt very strongly that that should be available for all to see because it is a story that's important and relevant to many um, people. Um, and so you can watch it in its entirety online at your leisure, um, but that will be on view on the monitor in the design gallery. This was recently purchased for the museum by Betsy Rosen and Liam Stokes. And then we are finally installing this wallpaper um, by Vic Muniz, Private Eyes. It was produced by Maharam, um, which is an interior design company. 
Um, so these are um, Victorian glass eyeballs that um, fill that entire back wall. It's actually really quite unsettling. Some of you may have seen the tube of this wallpaper. Um, it has been shuttled from office to office space since I believe Carla Hansel got it when the Vic Muniz was purchased. It was a gift from Maharam and from the artist to the museum. It is not um, an accessioned artwork. Um, so it will be installed in the galleries and then when Whenever we deinstall it, that will be the end of it. We will save a small piece for the archives. Um, but this is um, Muniz's sly commentary on the idea of surveillance. He did this in 2010, and it's interesting to see like just how much more intensely present and um, really um, subtle and overt at the same time that um, surveillance has become since we all are you know, walking around with our digital surveillance objects in our faces and in our pockets at all times. Um, so that will be watching you while you're watching Victor and Isolina. And then um, that back gallery, as I said, is filled with works that have come into the collection over the last year. Um, so some of these are group gifts. Um, we have received these two really important, stunning works from our longtime donors, Lauren Lassiter and Gary Ferraro. You will also note as with New Days, New Works, um, the donations and the installation cover all media and all departments. Um, so as with New Days, New Works, um, there are loose associations between these objects and loose themes in the grouping of them, which I'll go over at the end, at the end of this portion of the presentation. Um, but um, these are also works that should be considered unto themselves as well. Um, so uh, they donated this really important Art Smith um, cuff um, that uh, Smith made in 1946, um, but was in production through 1982. Um, Art Smith is really the first Afro-Cuban designer to achieve, uh, jewelry designer to achieve international recognition. Um, and he had some extraordinary retrospectives in recent years. I'm hoping we have those catalogs in the library. If not, we will get them soon. Um, but this is quite an extraordinary addition to the collection. And also Zanelli Maholi, who is a photographer that I've been hoping to get into the collection since I got here. Um, and hopefully some of you have seen the um, monumental wallpaper piece that Davidson recently installed at the Van Every Smith Galleries. Um, as I mentioned, Betsy Rosen and Liam Stokes donated uh, Victor and Isolina recently. They also purchased um, D'Angelo Diaz Corbina III, which was on view during Constellation CLT. So that, along with Diaz's other um, work, Epiphany, will be on view, uh, which the museum purchased out of Constellations. We are also um, going to install a selection from the donations Zachary and Emily Smith gave to the museum last December, just before that December 31st deadline. They gave a number of really stunning works on paper um, in allegiance with their collecting practice. Practice. It's all these explorations of color, uses of color in this really dynamic and bold way um, with a range of artists, mainly um, from 1960 to 1990. Um, also, Tony Podesta, one of Tony Podesta's monumental gifts, um, this for Linda de Broeker's Le Ni from 2007. Um, there's also a number of works from the second installment of the Porter Price donation. They gave a large collection of jewelry, which we um, called out in New Days, New Works. This is looking more at their um, craft and art donation. So this um, stunning painting by Gronk, a uh, very important uh, Chicano artist out of Los Angeles. Um, so his painting, Three Cornered Moon, and then a number of ceramic pieces that are coming into the collection. Um, and this is in anticipation of a number of other works of jewelry, as well as ceramics and paintings that are coming in over the next couple of years. Um, but then there are also works that um, the contemporary collecting group brought in, um, as well as purchases that the museum made from the Beam Endowment. Again, that endowment is only allowed to be used for art purchases. Um, one such work is Willie Cole's 1991 Silex. This is an intensely important piece. Um, and interestingly, it was on view at the Mint right after it was made in an exhibition that Mark Leach did in 1991 on Willie 
Charlie Cole um, very early on in Cole's career. It was one of his first museum exhibitions. Um, and one of the things that I details that I love about this work coming in is in fact, it has highlights this long-standing commitment that the Mint Museum has had over the decades to showing challenging art and art by um, not only artists of color, but artists who are using different media to create these powerful, provocative assessments of um, critical race theory, critical sociological issues. Um, it's, it, it's really a lovely recognition of this commitment the Mint has had a long-standing commitment. So in many ways, this is a moment where uh, Willie Cole Silex is, is coming home to the museum and I'm excited about that. Um, and then there are these other purchases again, coming out of the beam and the contemporary collecting group, Lakila Brown's composition is a um, promise gift from Charlotte and John Wickham. Charlotte is a recent um, board member uh, on the Mint Board of Trustees, as well as a contemporary collecting group member. Um, and then the museum purchased this Beverly Fishman work, a um, abstract consideration on um, the growing dependency on, um, on painkillers and opioids to, um, to not only escape physical pain, but emotional and uh, mental distress. And then um, there are a number of works um, like D'Angelo Diaz that are um, works that the museum purchased out of installations recently on view in the mint of uh, local and regional artists. So you see here Julio Gonzalez's headdress that was on view in the interventions installation over at Mint Museum Randolph um, and Milan Din's off-white. These gloves actually, um, we had hoped to put them in her constellation installation. We weren't able to because of um, safety concerns in those walkways. Um, but uh, the constellation prize for us is that we purchased it and now we're going to show it in the galleries. Um, so I'm exceptionally excited about this because I love this work so much. And I'm glad to finally have it in the collection and on view. Um, but so, as I said, this is um, a, um, a signal on the part of the Mint to um, really double down on that commitment to local and regional artists, not only showing their work in the museum, but also adding it to the collection um, and building on the Mint's collection of exceptional contemporary art that's not just national and international, but also attending to um, our local um, makers as well. Um, so there will also be on view a new work that is not in the Mint collection, and this is E.V. Day's Daytona Vortex. This is a commission by Jimmy Johnson, um, and it is one of his uh, suits that he wore in one of his winning races for the Daytona 500. He won Daytona 500 twice, um, and so this is a piece that he um, asked E.V. Day to create. Um, all of you know Evie Day as the artist who did Transporter, the piece that we have on view in the fourth floor perm galleries. It was a gift from Tony Podesta um, a decade ago, over a decade ago. Um, and John and Adam installed it in the recent reinstallation of those galleries. Um, and so it's wonderful to have, um, Day usually does works that address femininity and specifically women's clothing. Um, this is an instance where she is um, using this hyper-masculine male object of clothing, but also still exploring issues around gender. Um, and as is true with Transporter, um, is also exploring these ideas around um, technology and um, how that, how the human body and human existence coexist with technology and how our lives are changed and affected um, by the increasing technological age that we find ourselves um, spiraling in. So Evie Day and her assistant are coming, actually they arrived tonight, they will be in the galleries Wednesday and Thursday installing this piece. Um, so that will be um, kind of in the center of that new works, new acquisitions gallery. And it will be installed next to Janet Biggs duet. This is a work that Carla Hansel commissioned from the video artist Janet Biggs back in 2010. Um, it hasn't been on view since we had Janet Biggs 
um, exhibition, um, I believe in 2013. Um, but so this is an interesting um, pairing of this work. Um, this was back when Goodyear was still giving us lots of money. Goodyear actually paid for this commission um, and Dana Martin Davis helped to make it happen. Um, so this will be hung alongside um, Daytona Vortex. Um, oops, I misspelled it to my vortex. Um, so again, there's still that um, conversation between um, this new work that though not in the Mint's collection does have relevance to Charlotte, to the Mint. Um, Jimmy and Shani Johnson are longtime supporters of the museum, as you all know, um, and also important collectors. Um, and now with um, Chandra Johnson, Soko Gallery are also determining a lot of the artwork that is coming through Charlotte. Beverly Fishman actually um, was purchased from her gallery, um, as was the Hank Willis Thomas that is blinking uh, our blinking welcome sign in the um, Carroll Gallery. Um, but it does, it also explores the importance of um, of NASCAR to this region as well. And um, the conversations around uh, all that um, NASCAR contributes culturally in conversations around gender. Um, the Janet Biggs explores many of those same ideas that the EV Day work explores. Um, so installed alongside the EV Day are those pieces by donations by Zach and Emily Smith. Um, and here there is this, um, exploration of not only color, but also technology. So all of these prints works on paper um, that the Smiths donated are um, pushing the technological um, development of printmaking further and further. And so this balance between um, the themes of technology that EV Day is exploring in Daytona Vortex are mirrored in the artworks that are surrounding it, as well as in the more superficial relationship in the use of brilliant color um, and dynamic compositions of space. But then, oh, I'm sorry, I should also say. Um, so this is where I'm kind of showing you these loose connections in the installation. Um, so in, so those um, prints are leading up to the Daytona Vortex installation. Also surrounding Daytona Vortex are these other works, including uh, the Berlinda de Broeker Lenny is facing Daytona Vortex. Gronk's work is also facing it. Art Smith will be in a case nearby. Willie Cole is caddy corner to that gallery as all their Grovners. Um, so all of these works, in fact, are exploring um, very basically issues around corporeality or the body and how the body is considered both personally, socially, culturally. Um, so again, there are these other themes that one can connect in the gallery. But then that also drills down on the technological element. How is technology determining how our body can exist? Linda de Broeker's piece is coming out of images she was looking at from World War I and the horrible destruction of bodies, whether those were horses or animals um, who were caught in the crossfires of those um, ground battles or the actual um, fighters, the army and um, individuals who died. Um, and so World War I is this moment of extreme carnage because of those new technological inventions, whether it was the use of tanks, the use of airplanes, but also the use of gas. Um, and so those really upsetting, disturbing um, reckonings with the technological destruction that's being wrought on the body also very much relate to um, the Industrial Revolution and elements that are being explored in Willie Cole's Silex and the idea of um, the need for um, human labor to push forward the Industrial Revolution and how the practice of slavery and enslavement was, again, another way that physical bodies were um, not only damaged in real time, but how that effect um, resonated over generations, over centuries. Um, so these are all ways that um, themes can be found within the installations. They are not called out in the wall text in this way, like this overall general um, tying together of these different areas of that recent acquisitions, new works installation. 
um, it's not um, drilled down in the wall text. I mean, the hope is that as people walk around and read about the individual works, they will draw these narratives themselves and create new narratives. I mean, this is just my like take on them and why I put these works together in the spaces, but there are many different ways that one could read these these installs. Um, there's also another installation where the Fishman, Julio Gonzalez, D'Angelo Dia, and Lakila Brown are all um, in a space together. And um, again, like I chose these works to um, fill that space because they all speak to the idea of artifacts and cultural kind of insignias or tropes and how do, um, what are the artifacts that are coming out of our culture? How do they determine culture? Um, and how do they define it going forward, both individually, but also on a larger, broader collective um, way? And then also artists who are addressing place and space. Um, there's a row of works of artists who, um, whether it's uh, the Richard Estes uh, images of New York City, these hyper-realist images, or this um, more impressionistic interpretation, uh, Wolf Kahn's take on um, this nostalgic um, view of the, of the rural areas of the South, or um, Francis Spate's um, more, more sort of celebratory traditional landscape takes on, um, on the landscape that we see around us here in North Carolina. Um, so again, these are um, just suggestions, but hopefully everyone will come in and really draw their own conclusions from these installations. So then in the project room, um, which is uh, loosely titled Yesterday and Today, because it is um, presenting contemporary artists who are looking at past traditions and past artworks coming out of the decorative field, um, or I'm sorry, the domestic area, um, to create works of social critique. Now, again, domesticity is kind of the over writing theme. This can either be works of domestic craft in the case of Milan Din, who is using the Vietnamese Son Mai technique, um, which is uh, the inlay of eggshells and um, shells and uh, lacquer, um, usually used for decorative objects. And you see here this case from her family's collection. Um, she is creating artwork in the case of Off-White that are um, addressing issues of racism, um, both systemic and overt um, in our society. And I'm gonna turn it over to Milan to talk about that once I give the general overview of the gallery. Um, but then we also have um, the uh, tradition and history of decorative arts. Um, and you see here um, this teapot um, from the 18th century alongside Beth Lowe's tea from the recent donation um, from Porter Price, uh, tea and rice. Um, so here, this is, uh, Bethelo often works with images of food as well as language. Um, and this idea that um, not only actual food is a representation of culture, but also um, the presentation of food um, and whether that's using chopsticks to eat your food or it's presenting images of the culture that is connected to the food that you're, um, that you're eating. So in the, this case, the teapots, many of which during this period had images of China on them because of that connection um, of the tea importation with, um, with Chinese culture. And not only did that bring images, exploration, and narratives about China and the Far East um, and the entire environs of Asia, but it also associated um, those cultures with the idea of trade. And what I'm suggesting is the idea of service. And so having images of um, images from China, images of Chinese people, um, whether idealized or taken from those drawings that appeared in many of the travel documents that were trying to be as not only respectful, but also as um, factually documenting as possible. Having those appear on these objects that were then sold as teapots for your house, I mean, it really does, um, my proposal is, it really does even um, in a very subtle incendiary way over time associate 
these cultures with this idea of service and this idea of trade and commodity, um, it, it really does affect our perception of them. Um, and this is something that Beth Lowe and many of the other artists um, who are working in this vein are also exploring. Oops, sorry. Um, this came about because of an email that Leslie Strauss sent about this picture that was on view in uh, the Delhomme Galleries at Mint Museum Randolph. Um, and I just wanna thank Leslie um, for calling my attention to this picture. I mean, honestly, I did not see it in the galleries. I did not look in those cases closely enough. And um, her email really called, um, called me to task and I thank you. Leslie, I hope you're on this call. Um, so this actually kind of led to this entire idea for um, this installation um, because I wanted to um, I wanted to pull this piece and really explore it and talk about it in a way that was um, really honest and um, thoughtful. So um, this is a beer pitcher um, and it is um, illustrating a poem, as you see here, The Heathen Chine by Brit Hart. Um, the poem in actuality was um, not a, um, it wasn't, wasn't anti-racist necessarily, but it also wasn't racist. It's a poem that's describing a poker game where everyone is cheating. There are people of Chinese descent playing, but then there are also um, Europe, people of European descent and everyone is cheating. It's just at the end, uh, a Chinese man gets caught and there's a fight. Um, now, people pulled out that instance from the poem and it became an object to perpetuate um, Chinese stereotypes and racism against Chinese populations at a time that was particularly tense in this country um, because of uh, labor tensions around many Chinese immigrants having jobs on the railroad um, and other service industry jobs. And there was this real, this strong build in the 1860s and 1870s and you find find it particularly in the press against um, Chinese and Asian populations in general. So when this picture was made um, in 1876, and it was the best, one of the best selling pictures for Union Porcelain Works at the time, so it was very popular, and you find it in collections in the Metropolitan Museum, in the Baltimore Museum of Art, um, many institutions have this work because it was so popular. Um, but it really shows kind of this um, this uh, presentation of a really horrible, not only racist stereotype, but violence against this population in a way that just became unseen. On the other side of this picture is this image of um, uh, Gambrinus, King Gambrinus, who um, is a character from European folklore and he's an icon of beer, um, sharing a mug with um, brother Jonathan, who is kind of a, a pre um, figure to Uncle Sam. Um, and so this idea of these objects um, just existing, but not being seen or read um, in some sort of consistently um, attentive and thoughtful way is something that I was hoping this installation would call the task that every single object, whether it is just a um, teapot with seeming a bucolic scene on it, or something as overt as this, they all have messages um, with some sort of import or some sort of um, implication um, and how we need to consider all of this accordingly. I also want to say that um, the art historian, Sarah Cho at the Baltimore Museum of Art wrote a really wonderful post, blog post about this because BMA has this in their collection and I urge everyone to read that. It's also cited on the wall label. Um, and so if you're not writing down that citation, you can. Uh, see it on the wall label and get her name and look it up, but um, it's really quite powerful. Um, so I'm actually, oh, so that's supposed to be my next slide. Um, so I'm actually going to, oh, that horrible image of Sharon Nord. I'm going to move forward because I'm actually now running out of time and I want to make sure that we get to Milan and um, and uh, Nadia. So um, basically, 
there are other works that are exploring these same issues. So this pineapple teapot in conjunction with Sharon Norwood's Hair Matters, which gosh, you can't see here either. I'm so sorry about that. Um, exploring the ideas of trade and how the pineapple now in, um, particularly in Savannah where Sharon now lives. Sharon is Canadian um, by nationality, but of Jamaican descent. She now lives in uh, Savannah, Georgia. But you see pineapples all over. They become a symbol of welcome. Um, at the time this uh, teapot was made, it was a symbol of um, wealth and prosperity. Uh, but it also initially signaled um, the trade market and also um, the um, history of enslavement, the practice of enslavement in the Caribbean and also on the African continent. Um, so again, this idea of pairing these objects together as a read. Um, this is also um, something that's explored in Nadia Meadows' works, which she will talk about in a moment. These are mats made of African-American hair, um, and they are playing off patterns from quilts, some just um, the tradition of quilts, others um, exploring quilts specifically um, hypothesized to be used during the Underground Railroad, um, as many of you know, that is not something that has been factually upheld, but as also many of you know, um, because it was something that would not have been documented and written down, um, it's going to be hard to, in fact, find actual proof that that happened, but um, this conversation is something that is occurring more and more um, in cultural circles, and so Nadia is exploring that idea with her mats. Um, but these are, uh, the hair mats are installed with the quilts, but also with um, Victorian hair jewelry. Um, now, this practice was, um, had been going on since the Middle Ages, and it was sometimes used to memorialize people who had died, um, but it was also used um, intertwining living family members with deceased family members as sort of like a family tree, and then worn. Um, it was a domestic practice as well as a commercial practice. So women in their homes would create it. You could buy patterns for them, but you could also bring them to people to make them for you. Um, and so this is not, these are installed alongside Nadia's floor mats. And this is not just to call attention to this historic use of hair as a, as a symbol um, and the messages that can be read in hair. Um, but it's also to call attention to, uh, well, I wanted to call attention to the tension between European hair and African hair. And um, as Nadia will tell you, there's, um, she's dealing in this work, cell oppression, with issues around the stigmatization around hair, African American hair. And um, in this Victorian hair jewelry, while now, we find it unsettling because hair is um, it's deceased, from deceased people and there is something inherently unsettling about these objects I would, um, I would uh, propose. Um, there's also, I mean, they were celebrated, they were treasured. Um, and what I saw here was this historic tension, particularly in the women's liberation movement between um, white feminists and uh, feminists of color, and that um, even though there was all this ex experience of oppression that was shared, there was still this tension and this blindness on the part of many of many of the white feminists. I mean, to this day, we saw this when the women's march separated into two different marches because this. Um, this, um, this, I don't want to say, um, anyway, this um, tension is still existent within the women's, um, women's movement. And so I wanted to have that um, present in the galleries as well, that acknowledgement as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the artist now, but I actually want to um, ask Nadia, if you're here, do you want to go first? Because I know your time is a concern. Oh, thank you, Leslie, for posting the link to the BMA piece in the chat. Um, I don't know who's here. Let me check. Um, okay, so since I don't hear 
Nadia, nor do I see her on. I'm going to turn it over to Milan to speak. Milan, can you unmute yourself? Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm enjoying this um, this talk. <laughs> um, um, Milan, can I also just forewarn you because I didn't tell you what slides I had on there for you. <laughs> um, so we have the new piece that you made, the uncertainty of nostalgia. Um, and so that's that's what I have. And then I can loop back to the pairing of off-white with the Son Mai piece. Okay, that's fine. Um, this a, a, a little correction. The title actually is The Uncertainty of Nostalgic Things. Um, minor detail, but um, yeah. So uh, these plates that I have, um, uh, that you see, they are, I, I found them about a year and a half ago. And um, basically they are pressed milk glass plates um, uh, created by Fenton Glass. And um, they were commissioned by uh, the federal, um, I mean, the Federation of Women's um, Association, something, something or another. And it was, um, commissioned and sold to the American public from 1973 through 1976. And so when I came upon these plates, um, they were to commemorate 1976, um, oh, 1776 and through 1976, kind of the, um, the portrait of liberty. And I just, it just rubbed me the wrong way, the idea of um, how, how do we celebrate um, um, uh, you know, these, these years of um, what we call freedom, but freedom for, for who? Freedom for, you know, so th all these questions of equality, um, freedom, liberty um, came up. And so I took these um, press glass plates and cut slices out, out of them, kind of a reference to the American um, a slice of American pie, because they looked a little bit like pie slices. Um, and then I created these handmade um, pie slices and they are made from shredded paper. Um, and particularly actually they are made from shredded documents of a lot of different information. It's dense. Um, so, there are pieces of um, the Declaration of Independence. There are um, visa applications for um, you know, immigration to the US and how difficult, I mean, a lot of people don't know how difficult it is to immigrate to the US. Um, uh, the cost involved in all of that stuff. Um, it has um, uh, lyrics and so, um, musical notes, um, kind of score to different um, uh, songs that we, that we sing um, to celebrate patriotism in, in the United States. Um, uh, importantly, are copies of letters from my parents to relatives um, in Vietnam. So we, we are refugees and we immigrated to the US in the 1970s. And, and so that was kind of significant too, because these were made from 1973 through, through 1976. And those were the final years um, of the Vietnam War. And so this kind of parallel, this idea of um, parallel worlds and narratives that are going on on one hand where we're celebrating you know, freedom and liberty. On the other hand, there are hundreds and thousands of people fleeing a country in which the U.S. was directly involved, um, you know, to these refugee camps and my family being one of them. And so that's, that's in the shredded paper as well. Um, and also um, a leak document of um, the America First Caucus, which if any of you have a chance to read that, it is very, very racist. Um, it is um, a recently, it was like at least like a month or two ago by um, the right-wing um, 
part of the Republican um, uh, <laughs> um, Senate, and basically it is anti-immigrant, um, um, especially in their words, to return the United States to its Anglo-Saxon roots. Um, and so that's also shredded in. And so, and then from there I made pulp um, in which I dyed some of the paper in uh, spices that came from countries that have been colonized. And so all of that together to create these um, different slices of pie. Um, and, um, and then there's one pie slice in particular that, that is actually all black and is um, actually dyed with India ink or Chinese ink. And it is um, representation of, or a reference to erasure. Um, and so I don't wanna take up too much time. Does that, does that is it clear? It's, it's four plates basically with um, slices cut out of them. Um, Okay, so um, off-white um, is completely covered in eggshells. Um, it is part of my process in my practice in which I have um, for a while covered objects, um, completely covered objects with eggshells. And that has been an inspiration, um, this process. This process has been um, inspired by Sung Mai, which is a um, uh, traditional Vietnamese craft um, that is lacquerware that is inlaid with eggshells um, and shells. And it's usually done on, it's very decorative and it's done on, um, created on, you know, wooden boxes, trinket boxes or um, wall panels, um, things like that. And, and for me, I wanted to honor that, but also I, in my practice, I think, I believe that um, material holds memory, but also um, objects hold meaning. And so I'm, I'm very particular about what kind of objects I cover eggshells with. Um, for instance, this is um, a pair of boxing gloves. Um, on, actually on one side of the boxing gloves, uh, there's the American flag, but you can barely see it because it's covered by the eggshells. Um, and so this idea of, um, you know, our American history um, and it's, you know, this whitewashing um, of, of um, information, but you can bear, you do see parts of the American flag through the cracks of the eggshells. Um, and so, and I've, I've covered other objects um, like in the constellation, um, uh, installations with passports and envelopes and all of that. So um, that's it. Sorry, Milan, I was frantically trying to unmute myself and I couldn't. Um, I'm sorry, your name is mistyped here too. It was this whole slide that was pulled together very quickly. Um, and yes, and I'm sorry about the title correction. Haley, our um, amazing graphic designer just emailed me that she'll uh, fix the label because I did have the wrong title. Um, so I will, uh, Haley will have that changed on the label when the show opens. Um, thank you, Haley, for that. So Nadia also emailed me to tell me that she is not going to be able to make it because work got busy. So I am going to um, talk about her subtle oppression series very briefly. Um, but I am going to arrange in the spring in some format to have uh, Nadia Milan, as well as Lydia Thompson, who's also in this installation. Uh, and in my dream, Beth Lowe, because I love her work so much, um, come and speak about the work in person um, and really give justice to uh, the works and to the installation. So um, Nadia Meadows is a recent UNCC grad. She's quite young, but she really made these extraordinary floor mats um, over the last year, I guess she's been making them. And as I said, they're based on 
excuse me, patterns, not only from quilts, but also um, she explores general abstract patterns that have different connotations as well. And then also there are objects. So you see here, she's bending down in her studio in front of a suit jacket. And this is um, a woman's suit jacket and exploring the idea of um, women at work, particularly African-American women at work, and those ideas around hair. And um, as all of you have heard or read over well, the last couple of decades, issues around um, uh, discrimination against African-Americans and people of color because of their hairstyles, how they want to wear their hair, how they do wear their hair. Um, and so this is uh, Meadows exploring those ideas um, and those conflicts in that particular mat. So each of these mats has um, some sort of either conceptual or um, literal connection to some um, social um, construct. And she wants people to walk on them. That's really important to her. Um, and that is because she wants people to be uncomfortable with the idea for how they're treating particularly women of color around them. So I had wanted to install um, some of these on the wall so that you could look at the work. They're beautifully made and the textures are incredible. So I did want to have, and also like <laughs> wanted some of them to be protected. Um, but it's, it again, it's really important to her that they are not considered as decorative objects or as objects to be revered or looked at. But in fact, the walking on them, the experience of being forced to, to, to tread on them and to um, upset them in some way, whether it's like ruffling them or um, it's, uh, it's her way of forcing us to take ownership or to recognize even in just that moment of those moments in our lives when there has been this disregard, this disrespect, um, or just this disinterest in um, these moments of oppression for women of color. Um, so the work will be installed on the floor um, in the entrance to the gallery. It will be, um, you need to walk on it to get to the wall label, um, kind of, um, but it's, you're not being forced to walk on it. Um, there is a space in, further in the project room where you will have to walk on it to get into the space. And that was really, we rearranged the installation because Nadia wanted there to be one moment where you had to walk on it. There was no choice but to, to walk on it. So we, um, we figured that out because that is part of the piece. Um, so that is it. The, oh, I should also say the entire title of the work is Subtle Oppression. They have these individual names, which are not included on the gallery labels, um, because partially because um, Nadia um, thought them up um, pretty recently, um, but also because it really is an entire collection. Um, and so these are, these individual names are, um, are not really as much part of the work as this um, overall uh, cohesive title of subtle oppression. But um, there is a kind of checklist of all of the individual mats with their um, subtitles also on Teams, um, if you're interested in looking there. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions or any comments? I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Jen. I think this was really wonderful and really informative to help the staff understand um, not only sort of the overall broad thought process and, and um, narratives that are going on in that gallery, but also the individual works um, and some of the complexities that are involved in what the artists have produced and also how they're in, in relationship to other works in those spaces. Um, so obviously it's a very dense and complex interaction between these works. In other words, they're more than just recent acquisitions, right? So they are, um, they are works that speak to one another and also speak to um, uh, 
relevant issues that are on the minds of uh, not just staff, but our visitors. So um, thanks for putting that together. Thanks to C&E and, e and to um, education, and of course to the artists and to everybody who's been working on this. Um, I know that um, we're seeing great responses from our visitors when we do um, exhibitions that really drill down on um, issues that are relevant to their lives and make them think and contemplate. Um, and this show definitely, uh, this installation definitely will do that. So, um, so thank you all for working so hard on it. I look forward to kind of going up maybe sometime today and getting a sweet sneak peek. If someone would let Watch me in. <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta clear that with Michelle. <laughs> um, but sure, I'll be in there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if anyone does, I will be leaving um, for the break, um, actually Monday. If anyone does want to walk through the galleries um, Friday afternoon when we're done installing, um, please send me an email um, and I'll talk to Michelle and make sure that um, c &E is clear to have us walk around. But I'm happy to walk through the space and talk to people about the works individually. Um, that uh, yesterday and today, like that entire premise, that's on a wall label, like that's a wall text. There's an intro text to that space. So all of those ideas are written down and available for people to read. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of wall text in that gallery talking about these ideas. It's not uh, like the recent acquisitions area, which is much more about the individual works. Um, so all of those ideas that I talked about in the project space are on the wall as well. Um, so, but if you wanna walk around, let me know and I'll clear it with Michelle and Sini. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie again, um, I see you're here now. Uh, thank you again so much for, um, for like being the catalyst for that whole installation. I really appreciate your um, consistent considerations and like always, looking at what's on view and and um, and calling it out. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, thanks everybody.